Hello, everybody. Welcome to Hudson Institute's China Center. We host programs like this on a regular basis and hopefully uh, to uh, channel what on our mind and with the uh, general audience and hopefully uh, will be very useful uh, in our nation's challenge, uh, in our nation's effort to face the China challenge. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, Chinese telecom threat to the United States. You know, we uh, long before the uh, infamous balloon spot, uh, incident, United States has faced telecom threat from China for a long time, over two decades. That's because uh, in the past several decades, potentially compromised the devices from China. This threat extends beyond Americans' borders as countries across the globe have turned to Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE for telecom equipment and services and infrastructure. So it is not just a threat to the United States, but also to the global telecommunication networks. That's why the stakes are very high. Today, we have uh, a distinguished panel of experts to address this issue and I'm going to uh, introduce each one of them. Following my introduction of the uh, panelist, and we're going to go through some questions, and so each panelist will uh, address them with their uh, professional expertise. First, uh, our uh, uh, panelist is uh, our Federal Communications Commission Commissioner, Nathan Symington. Mr. Symington previously served as a senior advisor at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. In this role, he worked on many aspects of telecommunications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the US government's role in the internet. Prior to joining the commission, Mr. Symington was senior counsel to Bright Star Corp, an international mobile device services company. In this capacity, he led and negotiated telecommunications equipment and the services transactions with the leading providers in over 20 countries. Prior to joining Price Star, he worked as the attorney in private practice. Next, uh, our panel is Mr. Sohan Dasgupta. Sohan is a lawyer with an extensive background in telecommunications and international trade. He represents clients before the United States Supreme Court, federal and state appellate and trial courts, government agencies, state legislatures, and Congress. His practice includes trial and appellate litigation, public law, investigations, regulatory matters, and international disputes. Previously, Sohan served as Deputy General Counsel of the United States Department of Homeland Security and as a special counsel of the United States Department of Education. Next on our panel is Mr. Joshua Steinman. Joshua is a former military officer turned entrepreneur. From 2017 to 2021, he served at the White House on the National Security Council staff as deputy assistant to the president and the senior director for cyber. In that capacity, he coordinated all cyber telecommunications, cryptocurrency, and supply chain policy for the United States government. He is now the co-founder of at Govanic Co. at G A L V A N I C K C O, an industry control system cybersecurity company. Last but not least is our own senior fellow at Hudson, uh, retired Air Force. Brigadier General Robert Spaulding. Brigadier General Robert Spaulding is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. His work focuses on U.S.-China relations, economic and the national security, and the Asia-Pacific military balance. Welcome, gentlemen, to the panel. So what Hello, I do speaker. is, uh, yeah, I will ask uh, the first question for everybody uh, on a panel, each one of you, uh, uh, We'll have two minutes to answer. My first question to each one of you is that, are we doing enough to combat this threat from China? Where specifically are we failing? Commissioner Simonton, would you like to go first? 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Professor. So the United States has done a great job of limiting the presence of Chinese telecom equipment domestically, but that's only the tip of the iceberg and there's still a great deal that must be done uh, <clears throat> both domestically and internationally. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. So I think the conceptual change that we need is to recognize that Chinese technology that is not strictly telecom equipment poses substantial risks when it's included as a component of a larger cyber and telecom ecosystem. Um, we've come a long way since the foundation of Huawei in 1987 to build phone switches, right? At this, at, at, there, was a, there was the idea that we could limit telecom to the communications part. Now we're talking about automated data monitoring, about learning from AI and about automated industrial and other public safety controls. Um, we're, we're looking at the cyber environments around pipelines, manufacturing plants, uh, vehicular controls. So it's a different situation now. Um, it's also um, it's also very important for us to ask how things are abroad. Obviously, the same considerations apply abroad. But furthermore, there are questions about United States infrastructure, uh, whether those might be United States military bases, United States sub, uh, submarine cables, um, and what the presence of Chinese source technology increasing in other countries means, uh, particularly in countries where we have substantial military presence or national interests. And uh, I guess my last note here, we often frame this as solely a po military or political problem, and those aspects are serious, but also Chinese telecom poses a threat to the private sector as well. We have to remain at the forefront of telecommunications and its integration into technologies, and um, and we need to ensure that those resources are emerging from the, pri fri from the private sector for national security applications, and, um, and in that sense, falling behind town technologically is also a threat. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Simon Ten. Mr. Sohan Gasgupta, your take on this? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you. I think that whether we look at uh, um, China through the lens of China or Chinese companies' products and services, uh, the provisions made there, whether we look, look at them through the lens of um, adversarial foreign investment, sanctions, export controls, and the work, the important work that FCC and the commissioner are doing, uh, and there are examples of that about the control lists and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, last year, the president issued an EO executive order preventing U.S. persons from buying and selling securities in 59 um, China, uh, Chinese military industrial complex companies, including Huawei, China Mobile, Nanjing Panda, and so on. And then the FCC has prohibited the approvals of risky uh, Chinese telecommunications equipment because they present an unacceptable national security risk. But despite all of that, um, you know, it's it's a bit, little bit of a bandage on a problem until we uh, develop something of a domestic industrial base or uh, nearshoring capabilities of our own uh, for manufacturing, whether it be something as basic as PPE. I don't mean to call it, I mean to call it basic as in something as commonplace and, uh, and, and, and important and um, and um, high value as PPE, as well as um, ma materials as um, um, uh, as involved as uh, microelectronics and semiconductors and so forth. Until we have our own capabilities um, through, be it through um, a, a domestic industrial base or near shoring um, in what I what I like to call a whole free free world approach. When we were going through COVID, uh, we used to call it the whole 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 of government approach. So I call this the whole free world approach. And we're going to need four quadrant partnerships across the hemispheres. We have many allies and potential allies all over the world who can be uh, helpful to us in that regard. Um, I've been I've been thinking closely about what uh, on the adversarial foreign investments front the um, Committee for Foreign Investment into the United States, CFIUS, has been doing. And what the, the trend lines are that uh, when a hostile power's um, uh, surveillance or dominance would appear to harm the national security um, uh, apparatuses, the, federal, the U.S. government's national security apparatuses, access to uh, affordable or high-quality commodities, uh, something that would spy on the nation, misappropriate or sabotage data or um, increase the probability of uh, proprietary technologies usurpation. The committee has 
seems seems to have acted and acted rather uh, expeditiously. But here too, engaging in superior, uh, uh, better screening through um, intelligence sharing alliances with uh, our allies and partners all over the world could be beneficial to us. Um, and also by augmenting the free world supply chains, uh, increase, improving the free world supply chains by perhaps adhering to the defense industrial base sector or other kinds of um, other kinds of um, um, rosters and and, te and technologies. What is interesting is that despite this, as, as, as an illustrative example, and I think it is worth mentioning that despite the special relationships or other um, other uh, alliances that we have with many nations of the world, government to government, there isn't that conversation always uh, uh, happening. And, uh, you know, there is evidence to substantiate that. Um, and that is uh, that is something that uh, we would do well to um, well to explore and perhaps rectify. So that's my um, bird's eye view perspective on the matter. Thank you. You. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, General Spaulding, uh, what's your take on this uh, overall question? Are we doing enough to combat this threat from China? What specifically are we failing? I don't think so. I don't think we take a comprehensive view of security when it comes to telecommunications. So first of all, while we're um, getting uh, Huawei out of uh, and ZTE out of our networks, we still have uh, OEM approved OEMs that are manufacturing their equipment in China. That's a vulnerability. There's software development uh, being done in China. So uh, the supply chain currently is at risk, even though we've taken some actions. Then um, look at just in terms of physical security, how we secure our cell sites here in the United States. They're not, they're not very secure from physical access. In fact, um, you know, any engineer that comes in to touch any one of the, a, a carrier systems can have access to the other carrier systems. So having physical access to telecommunications uh, is a problem. And then, you know, you look into just the resiliency of the infrastructure itself. As we saw in Maui, um, the network is not built to survive many natural disasters or attacks. I think one of the problems that we have today is that we've um, we've been lulled to sleep by the fact uh, that commercial wireless is so ubiquitous, but it was never meant to be uh, a mission critical critical capability. And so, um, in places like uh, Maui, when you have a disaster, or uh, like in uh, Tennessee when the, the Nashville switching center was hit, you have you can suffer regional um, uh, outages. You can uh, suffer local outages that result in you know, life-threatening situations. And so I think it's not just the security, it's not just, uh, it's also resiliency. And I think, you know, more importantly, we've just stopped innovating in telecommunications. You look at the stock prices of AT&T and Ver Ver Verizon, you know, nobody wants to invest in, 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 in inventing new ways of thinking about telecommunications architecture because they don't think it's, you know, a sexy technology. I think we have to think more strategically about how we invest in, how we develop, and how we promote these capabilities because they're actually critical to to what we do on a day to day basis. And um, in, in, in when there's a natural disaster or some kind of um, you know man made crisis. Thank you, General uh, Joshua Steinman. What's your overall take on this issue? Yeah, it's pretty clear. So uh, President Trump signed EO 13873 back in, I believe it was 2018. We got the formal regs on that signed off. I think it was one of the last things that the president did uh, during his first term. And I just think we're not, we're not using those authorities that allow us to ban uh, companies that are connected to the Chinese Communist Party and other malicious actors from doing business in the United States. India has done this hundreds of times uh, already, and they've they've lapped us many times over. Uh, it can be Huawei, it can be ZTE, it can be Hike Vision, it can be Hytera, it could be uh, PUBG, these gaming companies. And the point is, the authorities exist. The current administration is not using them. Uh, we ought to be using them. And if there are legal challenges to be had, then let's go through the the legal process. That's it. It's simple. Great, great. OK, so we have uh, so many specific issues uh, to address. Let me pose the first question to General Spaulding in particular. 
uh, specifically, you know, uh, Chinese were infamous for its capability uh, for human intelligence. Uh, but recently, the electronic uh, signal intelligence for them also is increasingly uh, very formidable. Could you speak uh, to the uh, could you speak to the military element of the threat on our own soil? What risks does Chinese telecom equipment and the services pose to the U.S. military bases and activities? Well, certainly it's a it's a problem for uh, tipping and queuing for any kind of operation the United States military uh, might undertake. So certainly signals intelligence is important to that. But, you know, more important, I think, today is the challenge of personal devices in sensitive areas. And I think we have. Um, basically, we leave a bread trail for any uh, intelligence analyst to figure out um, if something is happening. You know, they're they're um, getting a, they're coming together in a certain place that's known to be a place where you do mission planning or something like that. So there are ways to figure out what you're doing just by, by um, the SDK data that comes off of personal devices. So I don't think that we are taking a comprehensive view in terms of how uh, intelligence collected. You don't need sophisticated signals intelligence to understand what's going on in the White House. You can see by personal device data that goes in and out um, who's who's coming in and out of the White House. Same for the Pentagon, same for for the Capitol. So thinking differently about, you know, how we protect ourselves from an operational security perspective is very important. And unfortunately, there's no real um, there's no real rulemaking yet that can really get at the fact that you know, the, the you don't need to have sophisticated intelligence uh, to, to really be able to collect this data and then mine it and then understand what's going on. OK, great, great. Uh, uh, Mr. Steinman, next question is for you. You know, the fundamental difference between the United States and China uh, uh, can be uh, uh, understood in many ways. One of the most obvious one, obviously, uh, China is a communist country with a very little private space. In the United States, the uh, the private sector uh, is the sort of uh, uh, the the core of our society. Uh, so uh, uh, we often frame this as a military or political problem, but Chinese telecom poses a threat to the private sector as well. Uh, uh, could you tell us why we should uh, why the private sector be concerned about relying on the Chinese technology in this country? There's no such thing as doing business with uh, private private companies uh, inside China. The Communist Party controls the country. When you're doing business with a Chinese entity, you're doing business with the Communist Party of China. It is very simple. OK, there are multiple overlapping legal structures inside China that mandate that any company doing business within that country, within that that sphere of political control, act on behalf of the secret orders of numerous Chinese domestic and foreign Chinese intelligence services, which means you can't trust the hardware, you can't trust the software. We're essentially open to a linguistic backdoor that just has to do with the, the differences in linguistics, differences in, in the way in which we interpret the meaning of words. And so the point is, is that like folks here in the United States think like, oh, I'm doing business with with Huawei, I'm doing business with Hytera, you know, buying this equipment a and they don't understand that. In fact, they're essentially just opening themselves up to existential exposure. And so, you know, I think this is really hard to do. It's one of the reasons why I think policy making at the federal level is one of the only options, because, you know, unlike people that live under the span of control of the Communist Party of China, like we're a nation of laws. And when those laws are in question, we can object to a court system that is by and large, although increasingly less so ordered uh, and attempts to be, you know, relatively even handed, right? And when you're when you're operating under the span of control, of the Communist Party of China, none of that stuff applies. And so it's just this systemic uh, systemic mismatch. And I think game theoretically, it advantages the Communist Party, which is why federal action is one of the few ways in which we can confront this challenge. Yeah, but what is, what will be the ultimate objectives of the federal uh, policy? Uh, because uh, we ban US companies from doing business with companies that are subject to the Chinese national security law, Chinese intelligence law, and any number of laws that require that those companies 
operate according to the secret orders and dictates of the Ministry of State Security and any number of other Chinese intelligence services. And, you know, you, you just have to stop it. It has to stop. It should have stopped 20 years ago. That was the best time to do it. The second best time is now. You're absolutely right. I was on Amazon.com recently. Uh, you, uh, the Chinese companies, something like something around 80% of all the sellers on Amazon.com are China-based, Chinese sellers, and they dominate. They dominate some of the, uh, Ban it all. Ban the, it all. Uh, the electronic devices uh, industry in this country. So they pose a serious threat. We have to end it now for all time. All right. Uh, this question for Commissioner Simonton. Uh, you know, um, an underappreciated element of this issue is really undersea cables. We keep talking about this uh, in the Washington circle, but it has not really sort of permeated in the, in the national discourse. Uh, something which the FCC is directly responsible for. Uh, could you, uh, as a you know, capacity as a commissioner at the FCC, explain this issue and why it's important from a national security perspective? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yu. Yes, absolutely. As um, I, I just uh, want to circle back a little bit uh, to reinforce a point that Mr. Steinman just made, and that's uh, regarding Chinese equipment. We also have to think about Chinese equipment that's in um, that's in our industrial logistical networks and not merely at, at the consumer product level. Of the, although, of course, the consumer product level is an exposed to tax surface. This is highly relevant to undersea cables because, after all, they need to connect to something on shore. So, as far as the FCC's responsibility, the FCC is the license issuer. Since uh, since the 1950s, uh, the it's not been possible, however, for the FCC to issue or revoke a license without uh, the approval of the State Department. And as uh, in an in the ordinary cor course, uh, State Commerce, DoD, and DHS and DOJ all have interests potentially in cables, as well as other agencies that uh, that have responsibility for the physical placement um, for the physical environments in which the cables are placed, such as, uh, for example, Interior and NOAA. So uh, so it's a very broad whole of government thing. Um, the United States has taken great uh, has taken significant steps to limit the use of Chinese built undersea cables. Uh, nonetheless, over 10% of all infrastructure worldwide is supplied by a Chinese company, HMN Tech, and a further smaller percentage is supplied by other Chinese-owned enterprises. And as uh, Mr. Steinman noted, when you're doing business with a PRC company, uh, you're doing business with the PRC. Uh, the United States is a very significant player uh, worldwide with over 20% of new build out and the PRC lays less undersea cable than France, the United States or, or Japan, but not an insignificant amount and increasing. Um, interconnection between Chinese and US IP network operators is sharply rising. It um, it more than quadrupled between 2015 and 2022. So, uh, so there's a lot of pressure to get that information or to get that information exchanged, uh, maybe evolving naturally without uh, without maybe as, as much oversight as we might like to have, although the United States government has started uh, paying more attention to this recently. In addition, regarding the capacities physically laying and maintaining undersea cable, which are obviously necessary to have a cable plant, um, there's only uh, there's only one of the approximately 60 privately owned ships in the world capable of doing so that's United States flag. There are two that are PRC flagged, but I think maybe just as important is that the majority are flagged um, under flags of convenience. And thus, even in cases where uh, there's no direct national security implication. There may be an indirect national security implication through the ability to pressure or the the companies or the national governments involved, and even the case where Chinese made cable is not being used. Um, I guess finally, the last thing I would note is beginning in 2022, uh, the United States government um, exerted influence to prevent um, new uh, certain new cables from connecting between the United States and um, and China directly, and this has led to a uh, quiet cable uh, cable laying rivalry um, between Southeast Asia, uh, the generally speaking the South Coast of Asia, which is a you know, very general term, and then getting all the way into the Middle East and Western Europe. So. Um, right now, there are rival projects under development there with the prospects that they may perhaps not connect um, or not interconnect in the way to which we've been accustomed. It's not at the point of there being a network split, but certainly the topography is growing more complex. Fantastic. I think that uh, really testify once again to this uh, fundamental contradiction of our time. That is, uh, the global free trade system has embraced 
the full membership of China, which is not a market economy at all. So that's why we allow China to take advantage of this uh, global free trade system. Uh, that's where I I believe is the source of uh, of the uh, uh, of all the problems. Now, this question that I, I have is for Mr. Sohan Gasgupta. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we saw some uh, significant gains in persuading allies to avoid the Huawei ZTEs uh, uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, where are we today? Uh, how would you characterize the threat to our allies? Is China prevailing in the battle for telecom internationally? That's, uh, thank you very much for your thoughtful question, uh, Mr. Yu. I think that uh, it's important to appreciate uh, that, you know, while um, um, during the Trump administration, great strides were made um, towards um, um, uh, tying up those part tying up those partnerships and some of the uh, effects have uh, have uh, effloresced since then for example i believe just a few months ago germany removed huawei from its networks so um uh, the, the you know countries are um paying attention because uh, sometimes it takes a while to catch up but then then it happens um the usg has um, itself imposed uh, pretty strong sanctions on the uh, on certain providers of surveillance technology uh, in the spy technology and of the, of the arms of the Chinese state um, de facto or de jure um, you know and I think that countries are waiting up are are waking up to the fact that when they undergo espionage um, IP theft um, perhaps the um, uh, providers uh, supplying of equipment to hostile powers vowing to obliterate certain countries, um, artificial um, undercutting of, of prices um, they, that they have to kind of um, uh, act on it uh, and respond to it. And sometimes what happens is that um, you know, many of these providers are um, do not necessarily adhere to the correct standards and or try to try to uh, foster a, a detrimental dependency of some kind. You asked a question about you know uh, who's winning and who's losing. Um, when I worked, when I when I was uh, um, paying attention, when I was uh, involved with Team Telecom and working on uh, looking at some of that information. Uh, during my days in the um, uh, federal government at DHS. And I know that Team Telecom is a big part of the commissioner's work and the uh, NFCC's um, portfolio and, and purview. You know, we saw that, you know, for uh, just a couple of data points that are that might be illuminating. For example, in 2019, Team Telecom denied China Mobile's FCC application to provide um, communication services because it was found to be, and this is a quote, vulnerable to China's exploitation, influence and control, and that China Mobile would likely com comply with espionage and intelligence requests made by the Chinese government. And that that is not a solitary um, example. There are lots of examples where that theme is um, pervasive. Um, then a year later, China Telecom uh, was found to be an untrustworthy and unwilling partner um, that had violated its uh, mitigation agreement. And um, Team Telecom again advised the FCC to terminate the submarine cable landing license. And they found that China Unicom was in indirectly directed, owned, operated, and controlled by Beijing. So the FCC revoked its authorization too. And there are lots of other examples. But, um, you know, I think that. As far as the broader point, uh, the question you raised uh, about it, it's that, um, and, I, and, I, and I think it's very important to focus on it um, because technological sabotage, economic espionage, uh, all these things, they, 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 there's a reason that, that these issues are important and it's part of it's economic, certainly, and part of it's that um, sometimes they can ir irretrievably and irreparably damage a free society uh, to a point that it can never get back on track, um, that the first victim of these uh, uh, of these uh, um, 
transgressions almost always is freedom of thought and freedom of expression because free thought exemplifies, as I've often said, uh, ordered liberty in its most exalted state. Uh, tyrants don't like that. And um, if we are trying to uh, foster an, an incubator of truth in society, then uh, and, and uh, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of ideas, uh, then it's protect, important to protect the means uh, whereby uh, wholehearted repudiation of forced conformity can be um, honored in fact and not just in breach. So that's great. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, very thoughtful reply. Now, uh, 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 Commissioner Simonton, if you don't mind, uh, I have a question here. You know, most of the stuff we've talked about so far is about the wired devices, the hardware for Huawei from ZTE. Obviously, the 800-pound gorilla right now in this uh, realm is the rise of satellite-based uh, wireless uh, communications. We're talking about 5,000-plus satellites launched by, uh, by uh, Elon Musk, uh, and uh, the China, uh, the Chinese government also runs uh, their own global positioning system called the Beidou. Does FCC have any regulatory oversight over the satellite-based uh, communication uh, uh, equipment, particularly uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the Elon Musk enterprise, as Starlink enterprise, as well as the Chinese uh, Beidou system? Uh, excellent question, because this is a, a fantastic opportunity for the United States to use the jurisdictional powers that we have um, to great effect worldwide. So let me expand on that a little bit. In order to send and receive uh, between satellites in the United States, you need an FCC license. We license the spectrum there just as we would license it for any other purpose. And since the United States is the world's biggest consumer of satellite services with probably over 50% of the world's entire satellite service consumption, that means that an FCC license is absolutely indispensable unless you're solely doing business in smaller markets. And the smaller markets I would note would include uh, would include uh, country would would include Russia and, and China. So um, so we have immense influence over the behavior of satellites, the kind of information that they could be required to share, for example, to mitigate the risk of debris. We in fact issued our first orbital debris fine over at the FCC just last week. So that was a landmark moment. Um, We've uh, we've got uh, sig very significant powers there. Now, uh, regarding the regarding the applications of these and, and the role in national security and, and future Chinese threats. Yes, there's a lot to say there. I'm going to try and keep it terse, but you know, let me know if I'm running one. Um, so the first thing is, ever since the days of um, of a true global constellation with Iridium, there's uh, there's been a really interesting capability that's been available for American national security use, and that's non-bent pipe transmission. In other words, you speak directly to a satellite, then the satellite system itself moves the message around to whichever ground station it needs to get to, or in some cases may always deliver it to the same ground station at which time it is rerouted. And either one of those approaches means that it becomes possible to use a worldwide American satellite network uh, for communications in a wide variety of contexts without exposing uh, activity um, to scrutiny, which is obviously very desirable if you're using this for peaceful purposes. So um, so it's it's great to have this facility. Likewise, the United States was first to the mark with a GPS system really very far ahead of everyone else, decade plus. Um, a lot of uh, this is one of these things. Other people only did it because we showed it was possible and we sh and we uh, showed much of the fundamental engineering that you would need to do to get it, whether that's with atomic clocks or whether that's with the structure of the of the position and timing signals or whether that's with the satellite density and altitude and whatever else. The difficulty there, however, is that the United States has not necessarily kept up and now there are more uh, more advanced GPS equivalent systems, in some cases, being delivered uh, by our friends and allies in Europe via Galileo or via Baidu and uh, and GLONASS, which is the Russian system. And so uh, this is this is sort of an interesting point. It's um, the there's uh, I've looked into this question, and there is the budget um, to put up the remaining satellites for this to fully modernize American GPS. Um, Four out of the six have been built and are sitting in a warehouse. So this is really just a matter of uh, a federal government will to um, to keep us up technologically. The difficulty, however, is that handset manufacturers and other uh, consumers of, of position and timing. They have to sell worldwide 
and their devices may start listening increasingly to Baidu and GLONASS over, um, over Galileo and GPS. And to the extent that that's the case, that's not licensed for reception in the United States, but if it's a handset capability, satellites have worldwide coverage of, in, with constellations like this. So if that's a handset capability, it's hard to prevent. You, you know, I, I'm not gonna be going around going papers please on people's phones to see which uh, family of GPS type uh, signals they're listening to. So the, the whole question is very complex and uh, the, the single best thing we could do to take the initiative here uh, would be to number one, uh, use greater uh, use of our commercial power that comes with FCC licensing and our large market share. And then number two, get the rest of our GPS satellites up in my opinion. Well, uh, you probably uh, don't expect somebody for, uh, like me to say this. Uh, what I will say is uh, more power to FCC. Uh, uh, so, say it uh, loud. Tell your friend. I will. You know, <laughs> so this is a, a, a. So next question, actually, um, uh, uh, maybe uh, General Spalding, you can you can uh, spearhead this uh, this answer here. You know, the uh, United States is global power. Global. One of the specific manifestations of our global power is our military presence in many parts of the world, uh, in countries where we consider uh, friends and allies, but some of the countries. They actually invite Chinese telecommunication services and, and use their equipment uh, where we have our military bases. And uh, we constantly involve uh, in joint operations with these uh, 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 countries. What risk does this situation pose and how does uh, how does that differ from our domestic and military concerns? Well, I think it, uh, it it's very similar. Uh, in fact, it's probably um, you know, almost exactly the same for in particular U.S. bases that are um, operating continuously outside the United States. It's the same kind of intelligence collection. It's the same tipping and queuing that happens. It's the same operational security um, uh, challenges that we face. And so, um, but I think more importantly, you know, these networks are, you know, not necessarily built for the type of resiliency that the military would need overseas and so um and and yet you're finding more and more these uh, these networks are being used uh, by military members both personally and uh, through government devices and um and unfortunately they weren't designed for that and so i think that one of the things that um that uh, i worked on in the white house is just this idea of leveraging commercial wireless technology, but doing so in a way that respected the security and resiliency requirements of the military. And I think uh, that's something that uh, even uh, in the DOD's embrace of 5G has not really taken off. So um, DOD is basically uh, and currently you know, looking at 5G just from a commercial market perspective. They're not looking at the resiliency and security requirements thereof. So, and that handicaps not just their operations, but it also creates, you know, uh, concerns for the population because they also need resiliency and security. So I think just um, not just, you know, the, the equipment that's near our bases overseas, but it's also how we just look at wireless architecture uh, from a resiliency and security standard writ large is a big challenge for us. And I think it's something, you know, quite frankly, the United States needs to invest time. It needs to invest resources. This needs to be a key um, competency for the country. You know, we used to have Bell Labs, you know, probably the premier uh, telecom research lab in the world at the time. Uh, all of that's gone. And so I think, you know, this is something from an industrial policy perspective. I think it requires focus, attention and money from the federal government to to um, get after. Great. Uh, so uh, my next question, uh, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Steinman can address this. Uh, you know, uh, when we deal with the many countries, uh, they look at the issue of less in terms of uh, the national security and more in terms of cost. They always ask us, OK, you convinced us that Huawei and ZT equipment are no good, but uh, can you give us an alternative? Uh, are the U.S. and its allies providing viable and economic alternatives in this sector? Uh, it's not going to happen because the Chinese Communist Party has very specifically gone out and created economic uh, incentives for their companies to come in well below market rate. 
So, uh, you know, when I was coordinating telecom policy uh, at the White House for the U.S. government, we would routinely have these conversations with European countries. And what, you know, their their senior ministers would tell me is that, well, we had Huawei come in here and offer us a, and it was something insane, like 30-year zero interest rate loan to buy this equipment. And you just can't compete with that. And I think the answer is always tariffs, tariffs, tariffs. We have to be tariffing these these companies. We have to be sanctioning organizations that do business with them. The Europeans were incredibly short-sighted. Uh, they routinely said things like, um, well, we need to get our telecom networks up to snuff. You know, 4G rollout didn't go that well. Uh, and we would remind them that there are two perfectly fine European manufacturers, Ericsson and Nokia. And they would say, well, you know, that uh, too expensive or something like that. It's very short sighted. And frankly, this goes back to national policymaking. And, you know, we talked uh, about very aggressively pushing these countries towards doing the right thing, which, you know, many of them wanted to do. And the reason why they didn't was these entrenched interests, telecom interests, private sector interests, some political interests. And the point is that the United States still has an incredible amount of leverage over all these NATO countries because we essentially subsidize their national security. And the point is, is that if the United States wants, we can absolutely and aggressively uh, encourage them to do the right thing. But until you have leadership at the top, it's not going to happen. All right, so that's a good point. Uh, 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 we cannot in just encourage them because those are sovereign countries, their friends and allies. Uh, nevertheless, they have their minds of their own. Hypothetically, if we could not convince our friends and allies to go along with us and they decided to use China's uh, uh, equipment, will there be a time when the US, United States basically cut off uh, intelligence sharing and uh, create our free cyber domain of our own? Uh, in opposite to the Chinese dominated uh, well, this is what we need uh, to be separate doing. domain. Yeah, this is what we need to be doing, which is explaining to folks that um, you know that that our our military aid, our economic aid, which helps prop these countries' economies up, comes with expectations. And uh, we had this conversation with many people where it's like, well, we have troops stationed in this country. They won't do X, Y, or Z. There's all these other agreements that we have. It could be information sharing, et cetera. And, you know, the, the point that I made to many of them is if we can't trust these networks, how can we trust these relationships? And you have to play hardball. You know, it is no crime to be honest with your friends. In fact, it's how you actually create a bar between who is your friend and who isn't. We have to be very clear. We have to be willing to set boundaries on what we're willing to do for these other countries. If they're not willing to respond, then let them let them foot the full bill for their own national security. Uh, I like to hear I love message. I approve that message, I would say, even though I'm not running for public office. Oh. So uh, we have a little bit of time remaining. So I like to pose a general question for everyone. Uh, again, you know, each one of you probably will take a two or three minutes to answer. That is, uh, um, as I say earlier, one of the profound um, contradiction of our time is that uh, the international global free trading system is embracing a non-market economy like China and allow the Chinese Communist Party to benefit tremendously from the system uh, of which it is not part. So uh, uh, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because uh, uh, even if we avoid contracts with the companies like Huawei, ZTE, and others for telecommunication equipment and services, our current supply chain always tends to guarantee that our systems inevitably end up with the Chinese manufacturer com components. How far should we go in avoiding this? Uh, I'll start with the uh, with the Commissioner Simonton, please. Uh, thank you, Professor. So um, 
the uh, part of why we're in an unprecedented situation today, the the USSR didn't really make anything that anyone else wanted except oil. Uh, the uh, the if, if we look back at 40 years ago at Chinese telecommunications, it was in its infancy. Uh, notably, Huawei wasn't even founded until more than 100 years after the first phone call. So, you know, there was a certain amount of catch up. Nonetheless, today we do not enjoy onshore dominant market power in wireless telephony or advanced wireless manufacturing equipment. And so we are creating national security problems for ourselves that we'll never be able to solve if we allow ourselves to fall behind in these technologies because companies um, and other enterprises looking to deliver services to the American people are going to be under pressure to obtain equipment containing Chinese components. And I'm not talking about individual silicon chips here. Huawei and ZTE get uh, some attention. The drone companies get some attention. Um, I rarely hear people talk about publicly about the likes of Quactel and Fibacom. Um, in the IoT modem space, but those are of grave concern in the utility sector, uh, for for one example. So, the but the fundamentally, these components are not here because China has cheap labor. Uh, the cheap labor ship has sort of sailed. Chinese labor is not nearly as cheap as it was 20 years ago. Um, the true low wage manufacturing has moved on to other geographies. At this point, if Chinese equipment is cheaper and better, it's partly because of the subsidies at the state level that Mr. Steinman has alluded to, and also because of Chinese sophistication in a combination of industrial espionage. I don't want to give that short shrift, but also very, very strong onshore R&D with fast product cycles, onshore prototyping, and, uh, and, uh, and beneficial communication up and down from the manufacturing floor to top management and back with, uh, with prototyping, scale manufacturing, and basic research often being just within a couple miles of one another in Shenzhen or other locations. So my takeaway from all of this is that we aren't going to be able to afford to decouple from China unless we get real about the capabilities that Chinese equipment uh, provides and the attractiveness of those capabilities in our own domestic market, never mind the worldwide ones. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Das Gupta, your take? That's very kind. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yu. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I largely agree with uh, everything the commissioner mentioned, and uh, you know, in the in the world in the world of um, uh, uh, adversarial foreign investments, and this is just some, something I've been thinking about. Uh, we often look at TID, which is uh, critical um, technology, critical infrastructure, and uh, sensitive data. Now, the 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 T part of it, the technology part of it. Um, you know, if our R and D falls behind um, in in relation to um, certain other countries, um, and uh, there there's no choice uh, in in for our supply chains uh, to have no choice for our supply chains or the elements in our supply chains, but to have to uh, end up with um, the manufactured products of uh, of hostile um, hostile states. Then that's as much a failure of our R and D as it is, um, and our uh, developmental capabilities, an indictment of that as it is of legal, economic, and and other um, uh, and, and other um, factors, uh, and therefore the solution also uh, lies more with our um, technological competence and uh, and uh, um, capabilities of refining them. So I think that. It's important to focus on that. I know it's uh, you know it's it's the um, hard work of building up and being innovative. But we were there once, and hopefully we can reclaim that ground again. Thank you. Over. Very good, Mr. Steinman. Your take? Yeah, it's simple. We need to tariff these countries. We need to impose costs on U.S. companies that want to use. These uh, these technologies, these uh, uh, you know, whether it's microelectronics or parts, etc., and we can change the incentives. At the same time, there's obviously a whole bunch of other things that we need to do, like make it easier to site and permit factories, make it easier uh, to do retraining, and then focus on U.S. education. But it has to start with imposing costs on the companies that want to do business with the Communist Party of China. Until we do that, there will be no domestic incentive for folks to try and really push for reform 
for siting and permitting and education, because there's always going to be this shunt. I can go buy inexpensively abroad. The beginning is always tariffs. We have to impose costs. OK, great. Uh, last but least, uh, General Spalding, you have the last words. This is uh, actually we did this before. Um, we we need to restore the regulatory framework that existed in the, during the first Cold War, uh, and that ought, ought to be extended to our allies and partners. To the extent they want to be our allies and partners, they have to follow the same regulatory framework. I'm talking about things like COCOM, the uh, Coordinating Committee on Export Controls that existed during the Cold War. There's a whole bunch of other uh, Commerce Department, Treasury Department. <laughs> state department regulations and rules just bringing them back uh, bring back the u.s information agency all the things that we built over the 40 plus years of the cold war we need to restore and recognize we are in the second cold war and quite frankly it's an ideological and economic competition it's not uh, going to end up in you know direct military conflict uh, heaven forbid or else you know nuclear weapons are involved so i think Focusing on winning the second Cold War starts with going back and doing the things that we did during the first Cold War. It's that easy. China would not be China without the technology, talent, and capital of the free world, period. That's an excellent point. Um, I'm totally for COCOM, the Paris Coordinating Committee, that uh, is a part of the Cold War strategy. Again, our competition with China is not just limited to the technical and uh, uh, specific uh, transactional uh, basis. Uh, we are embarking on a gigantic uh, fight with the, a model of governance that would decide the future of the world. So it's a purely ideological and political. So I agree with you uh, uh, 100%. Now, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, uh, for your expert uh, opinion and the sage recommendations and uh, uh, for the uh, for our listeners and the viewers. And uh, my name is Miles Yu. I'm a director of the China Center here at the Hudson Institute and have a Huawei free day. Thank you. <laughs>